Well, welcome to the uh, Top M&A Entrepreneurs, where every week we talk to active entrepreneurs about their process, where and how they source their deals, the industries they work in, how they analyze deals, valuations, due diligence, and the ecosystem they work in. We also talk about their successes, failures, and their backstory, why they do it, how they do it, how they got started, their adventure, the mentors who inspired them, the challenges they faced, uh, and how, what they crossed that threshold. Um, you know, and what keeps them motivated going through the process. Today, my guest is Roman Balin. He's the founder of Doodilio, and that's spelled D-U-E-D-I-L-I-O.com. Uh, it's an M&A due diligence marketplace. And as well, he's the publisher of the Business Inquirer newsletter. It's a cool, pretty cool new, newsletter. He analyzes uh, uh, small kind of companies for sale and gives his thoughts on those based on a due diligence background. Uh, Roman began his career in investment management and moved to investment banking. In 2013, he caught the bug, entrepreneurial bug, and co-founded one of the first alternative data consulting firms counting some of the most well-known hedge funds as clients. And he actually sold that business and since then has been active in the uh, acquisition, entrepreneurial acquisition space as full-time on due diligence and the business inquirer. As, so, as well as some other projects. So I want to welcome Roman. How are you doing today? Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on. I know due diligence is not the uh, not the sexiest topic <laughs> out there. So. Uh, I, I disagree <laughs> because this is a case where there's one phrase, no deal is better off than a bad deal. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that's the whole premise of this deal. So tell me how you started Doodilio. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's not one thing. It was really a combination of a couple of things. Uh, so first, uh, it, it started off with a, just a personal pain point that I had. Uh, I bought uh, a small service business um, a couple of years ago, a small acquisition, and I was looking for an attorney to help me draft an asset purchase agreement, and also someone to help me review the financials just with a fresh set of eyes. I have a bit of a financial background. I can crunch the numbers, but it's always good to have someone else just to kind of uh, view it with a fresh perspective. So, you know, I spent so much time um, interviewing people, finding the right provider. It was a small acquisition. So, you know, I, I couldn't go to, you know, a larger, I'd say even mid-sized firm to do this. Uh, it just didn't make sense. So um, it took me probably a month to find someone to help me analyze the deal. So that was a first, you know, kind of a personal pain point there. Second, um, kind of, I guess, fast forward, uh, I started the business inquire uh, about, uh, I think, 12 months ago, a year, maybe a little bit longer. And uh, as you mentioned, it's a newsletter where I highlight interesting acquisition opportunities, kind of give a bite-sized commentary on each one. Um, you know, readers are generally searchers, um, independent sponsors, some private equity guys. And... Um, as the readership subscriber count grew, you know, I, I started getting pinged uh, by subscribers just asking, hey, this deal looks interesting, but um, can you help me find someone that can help me do due diligence on it? Yeah. And, you know, as time progressed, I got enough of these pings from people where, um, you know, kind of the light bulb went off. And I thought that, you know, today there's a marketplace for anything. Uh, whatever you want to get done, there's a marketplace for it. Um, and you know, why isn't there a marketplace for due diligence, right? It's, yeah. a, it's a very uh, fast-growing space. Uh, more and more deals are getting done. Um, what about the due diligence aspect of it? So, yes, there are platforms like Fiverr, Upwork, Catalant, but they, they don't... Top, top Total, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, Top Total as well, yep. Yeah. But they don't specifically focus on uh m a due diligence yeah so um you know i thought uh why not give this a try so um i launched a dealio about seven months ago and uh yeah that that's kind of the founding story um it's kind of a combination of personal pain point as well as a little bit of crowdsourcing 
Yeah, solve your own problems first. And they go, like, is anybody else having these problems? Oh, yes, they are. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's go back to that story. Did you buy that little small business or pass? I I did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. What was that? Uh, It's um, it's like a resume building service, career service business. Um, Oh, interesting. And is that still going? It's not. I, I sold it. Oh, okay, okay, cool. And uh, yeah, it, was a, it was a quick, uh, quick turnaround. <laughs> so, where did you find uh, this this uh, person to do due, due diligence? And I mean, was it, did it make sense on this small? Was it's a smaller business under one million well, or what? Yeah, you know, I found it through my uh, through my network. Um, I asked around, uh, interviewed a lot of people, and uh, one person was kind of the right fit. Had experience with. Uh, so from a, you know, I'm talking from a legal perspective, have experience uh, with these types of you know, smaller acquisitions and priced right. Uh, and then on the financial front, also had a, um, through the network, uh, I found um, someone to help me review the numbers. And how, how is it going now? Seven months later, uh, by the way, I'm going to go back to the marketplaces. Um, I love marketplaces because I started a marketplace called Turbo Squid, was where buy and sold 3D assets. And once you get um, the founder of LinkedIn, loves marketplaces because LinkedIn's a marketplace. So yeah. if you if you get established in the marketplace, it's incredibly difficult to displace it with some other competitor. Number two, I mean, look at Airbnb, uh, you know, Amazon or uh, eBay, something like that. Uh, so. Right. I, I love this. That's kind of why I had you on to talk about this. So how is it going? How, you know, the, your traffic, your, your, your sales, your number of, you know, inventory, which is both sides buying and selling going. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I launched about uh, seven months ago at launch. I had about thir- I think 30, maybe 25 vendors on the platform um, doing the due diligence. Yeah. Uh, right now, we have over 160 uh, pre-vetted due diligence service providers, and that's including independent professionals, uh, boutique firms, uh, and mid-sized firms. Yeah. Um, since long- so, let me let me let me interrupt you, Elena. So, if I can give you a scenario where you know it's a, a sub-million-dollar business. Um, and it's an internet business, um, you know, let's say Amazon or a service-based business or a reoccurring revenue type deal. Uh, and then I'm going to go here. I said, look, I, I don't know anybody to do diligence. I keep going to my attorney and they're not experts at it. So I do what? I'm going to go on the site and then what happens? Exactly. So you go on the website and you fill out uh, a short form. Uh, it shouldn't take you more than two to five minutes to fill out. And it basically asks, okay, what are you doing? Uh, is it an acquisition? Is it an investment? How big? Uh, at what stage are you? Are you are pre-LOI, submitted LOI, post-LOI? Uh, when are you looking to hire someone? Is it ASAP? Is it uh, in three weeks? Is it in two months? Uh, and then uh, we ask about uh, you know, what exactly you're looking to do. We have over 20 uh, do types of due diligence uh, listed uh, on our website, on the form. So depending on the type of business you're buying, um, you can see this list of available due diligence services and, um, and pick out what exactly you need, uh, whether it's um, a quality of earnings. So that would be more on the financial side, or if you're buying um, an Amazon business or let's say a Shopify store, e-commerce store, then maybe you want to analyze their uh, digital marketing spend and see um, you know, what's their ROI and is there uh, any, any room for improvement? Uh, yeah. Do the numbers make sense? Um, so it's really depends on what type of business you're buying of course, how much you want to spend on the diligence because you can, you know, there's unlimited. How, so what, what are we talking about in ranges? What does that look like? And how fast? Two, two questions in one there. Yeah, so, uh, so it takes about uh, two days for uh, us to present you with proposals for your project. Um, and then, uh, then it takes you know, a day to hire someone. 
Um, so it's the whole process is, takes kind of three days to go from submitting the form to hiring someone. That's that's kind of the you know, a standard scenario. Of course, if you have questions and things like that, it could take longer. Yeah. Um, pricing varies widely, and that's you know I think that's the biggest value value that we bring is that if you're buying a two hundred thousand dollar transaction of a Shopify store, you need someone to you know you want to spend maybe one two thousand dollars on due diligence, maybe do some financial due diligence, basic uh, digital marketing due diligence, we can source someone for that price range. If you're on the other step, on the other hand, if you're um, do, if you're you know independent sponsor doing let's say a healthcare roll up and it's a 25, 20 million dollar deal, uh, then we can help you source uh, you know due diligence providers that may be a little bit more of a name brand where you know, quality of earnings maybe will cost between twenty five and fifty thousand dollars. And, and um, let me let me go back to the uh, the small one uh, because yeah. do you, do when I fill out the form and I said, hey, I need this quality of earnings uh, report. Do I'm already have an NDA with this due diligence specialist to, uh, because they're going to start seeing all the financials from this person, and or is my NDA that I have with the seller cover the due diligence specialist. So you're going to sign an NDA once you hire the due diligence, uh, okay. whoever you want to work with. That's yeah. going to be another NDA, correct? Yeah. And do that? does that NDA specialist kind of act on behalf? Like he starts saying, okay, buyer, I need you to start asking for the uh, three years of income statements, uh, a cash flow statement, and a balance sheet. And I need you to ask for like Stripe accounts and bank statements or IRS documents. And then, then right. they, and then the, the buyer goes back and asks for him for that or, or what? Or that's yeah, so, always supposed to be. Um, so it can work kind of one of two ways. Either uh, the due diligence service provider can work with the buyer and the buyer can communicate with the seller. That's one yeah. way. The other way is the due diligence service provider can just directly communicate with the seller and uh, present them with a list of documents that they would like to see. Um, that really depends on um, you know, how the client wants to uh, structure it. Yeah, now what, what are you seeing normally? Um, uh, you know, somebody that's buying a $200,000 business, is that a newer uh, you know, buyer and not aware of the process of what they should be asking for? Or are they just, you know, at some point it goes, no, hey, I want you to talk to my due diligence specialist. And then they start asking all this stuff. And Typically, what I've seen is in the smaller transactions, the due diligence service provider will provide a, a kind of be a guide for the uh, for the for the client, for the buyer yeah. and help them um, ask for the right documents, ask the right questions. Then once they get the documents, analyze them, go over the results, uh, just help them uh, really understand uh, the you know, operations of the business, financials, yeah. whatever it may be. Yeah. So what is that? I, I know you're just a matchmaker on that side. So what is the analysis and opinion offer? I mean, it's pretty easy to say, hey, it's like, okay, you're not making money. There's no net income. There's no EBITDA. It's negative you know, this is not a 1x EBITDA or a 5x EBITDA, it's, it's something else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the goal here is not really to provide a go or no go decision. I don't, that's not the goal of the um, due diligence service provider. The goal here is to make sure that the buyer uh, goes into the transaction with their eyes open, um, understands what what the business really is. Does the um, do the numbers match what the seller uh, has presented, and just just help them uh, go through that process and really understand the business. Yeah. So um, it's it's not uh, it, it's really not a you know yes you should buy the business or no because that that's up to the buyer. That's that's right. not. Uh, that's not up to the due diligence provider. Yeah, but, but what kind of what kind of information does it reveal? So, like footnotes or you know cash flow or 
uh, you know, these guys got a lot of debt or something like that. What, what kind of analysis does that look like? Um, so, uh, you know, probably the most requested type of analysis is financial due diligence yeah. and uh, just uh, looking at normalized earnings, right? What's the, are there any one-off items? Are the ad backs uh, appropriate that uh, the uh, seller has, um, you know, has added? Um, you know, how do the numbers look on a normalized basis? That's probably the most requested um, type of due diligence. Now, uh, I'll be honest, I'm not personally a due diligence provider. Yeah. So I, I, I can't go into the, you know, uh, I'm not a CPA to go into the specifics, but just based on what I've seen, um, you know, since launch, we've done about 90 due diligence projects or facilitated 90 due diligence projects, I should say. Um, and um, th that's, that's really the most uh, requested type of uh, the financial, the, right? Sure. The financial that seems to be the biggest kind of uh, black box for. Uh, yeah. Black. So yeah, let's talk about that ninety. Um, what does that look like as far as time to start? They request the due diligence and they complete the due diligence, and the buyer gets back to the seller, and can make his own determination or, you know, decide on the value of the company. How long does that take, and what's the cost of that? Oof. Uh, oof. Um, what's, what's like, I guess, like the, the high end, low end and uh, rent medium. Yeah. So so let, let's take uh, let's take financial due diligence, for example, because I think that's that's the most requested and it's probably most the, requested. Like, Got to believe that tells a story. That's all. That's all Warren Buffett looks at. Man, hey, send me right. your financials. He looks yeah. it over the weekend and then comes back with an offer. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, so. So I'd say there's kind of three levels of financial due diligence. Um, kind of the easiest is just verify the financials, which is just take, you know, take the PL, take the tax returns, and make sure everything matches up. That's that's simple. Something like that typically could take a day or two. So that so let me get let me ask you about that. So they're gonna ask for uh, like bank statements. They'll ask for bank statements. Yep. Bank statements, and they're going to match the income statement with the bank statements and say, yep. hey, this was actual sale. These, you know, whether it's a cash accounting or accrual accounting, and, uh, you know, yep. this bank statement matched that sale or or it's consolidated in that uh, year's worth of sales. Yeah, it's going to be more high level. Yeah. Uh, but 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 yes, I don't think it's not going to drill down into specific, uh, you know, specific daily sales or monthly right. sales, but it'll, it'll be more of the high level. And, you know, something like this can cost anywhere from $500 to $1,500. Right. It's, it's relatively cheap. It's uh, someone that has a financial background can do this relatively quick. They know what to look for. Um, and again, it's, it's a very, it's a very high level analysis. Yeah. Um, if we move kind of one, you know, one step, uh, one step up, it's probably going to be something like, uh, you know, proof of cash and again, um, you know, normalized earnings. That's going to be a little bit deeper. It's probably going to require a little bit more information might take, um, one or two weeks to do, um, costs anywhere from 2,500 to maybe $5,000 Yeah. Right. to review like three years of financials. Uh, and then uh, once we go kind of one step further, that's the quality of earnings report, right? That's the kind of all encompassing deep dive to make sure all the numbers line up. What's the normalized earnings of the business? Um, again, looking at one, two, three years um, and something like that can cost anywhere from that. That's a, that's a wide range uh, because then uh, you're getting into kind of the boutique and mid-sized firms. Yeah, what, what what are you what size are you talking about in revenue? Where you think you should go? Where where's the 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 match? Where you know just one is you know checking the income statement with the bank statements. You know that's good for a five hundred thousand dollar business, et cetera. Where what is that? Where's the matchmaking look like? They're lined yeah, up together. That's a good question. Um, I think that so so a full quality of earnings typically is required required by lenders or investors. 
Uh -huh. So it's something that uh, that's a required piece of analysis, and, um, and it, it costs more. If if you don't need uh, full quality of earnings, I, I would say you're probably good with kind of that second step of just uh, you know an ad hoc nor, nor, uh, sorry normalized earnings analysis um, that an independent professional can do. Or you know maybe a boutique you know, boutique firm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Does that answer kind of the? the yeah, the, I, I mean, you just really said it because if somebody's going to go out and buy a business and they're going to get a loan or bring in investors, they're going to have to go to quality of earnings. Uh, the, the, everything the, else is like, you know, it's kind of eyeball spitball and go. Yeah, and you know, ultimately, um, due diligence is insurance, right? Um, when I was uh, you know eighteen, I didn't have life insurance. I'm now yeah. close to 40. I have life insurance and I'm spending money on it. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how I, I look at it. Um, you, you can spend as much as you want on the diligence. It's, and it's not for me to say well, you should do this or you should do that. Yeah. Uh, but there's no perfect deal though. There's no perfect deal. Right. There's no yeah. perfect deal. It's so it's always, uh, how much risk are you willing to take versus how much are you willing to pay to have some level of uh, comfort with, with the risk that you're taking, right? And if you're buying, you know, a $500,000 transaction, $200,000 transaction, $100,000 transaction, are you going to spend $50,000 on the diligence? You know, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Sometimes yeah. But that's, but again, that's, uh, that's really a personal choice. Um, you know, what, what we try to do is just explain all the options uh, educate our clients on the different costs uh, and uh, help them make the decision. Um, but, but it's really not up to us or even the due diligence service provider to say, hey, this is... Right, right. They're, they're, they're not, I mean, unless they develop a relationship with them. Right. They, like, right. Hey, great. Uh, curious about that. Um, and Fiverr does that too. And they love you to use the same guy, but they don't, you know, once you start finding out who that person is, they don't want you to go around and go outside it. How do you, how, how do you prevent that where they develop a relationship and then they just take uh, Dudilio out of the picture? Uh, so no, so we, we actually encourage that relationship. I think um, our goal is to connect the client with the due diligence service provider uh -huh. and for them to actually have that relationship. Uh, yeah. Because I think that's, uh, that leads to the optimal outcome and that's the, that's a good working um, you know, that's a good working situation. Uh, we don't get in the middle. We help them answer any questions. We help them, we help guide the client on what's available. Uh, we present them with proposals from our network of um, what due diligence is available, how much it's going to cost. And then once they choose a proposal, we make an email introduction between the client and the due diligence service provider. Um, that's it. Uh, we're there to answer any questions. We collect feedback, of course, along the way, uh, but uh, we, we're not we're not standing uh, in the middle. Yeah. Well, what about the? I mean, if the second sale happens, and I'm asking from a marketplace founder, go because like, how do we get these guys to make sure you know we get a piece of the toll the toll gate on the second sale because that's when our marketplace grows is the second sale, right? We spent all our money acquiring the first guy that first customer in the marketplace, we want them to keep coming back and coming back. Right. Um, that's a great question. So in terms of, so there's nothing to prevent the, uh, the client from going to the same provider uh, and not going to the Dilio on a second acquisition. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in my mind, that's okay. And that's what I want. Um, we have um, a contract with everyone on our network, all the service providers on the network. Um, and it's, it's trust-based that just says, listen, if we bring you a client and you help them and they come back to you in 18 months, uh, we think we deserve you know, a referral, uh, referral fee from that as well. Yeah. Um, is there, I don't think Fiverr, uh, Upwork or Calant uh, or Graphite have, uh, invented any way to prevent slippage. I think that's 
that's part of the um, circumvention. That's, yeah, yeah, circumvention. Just, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's just part of the business model that you have to accept. Um, right now, we are very much a high touch manual service where we don't have uh, a back end. Um, it's kind of it's us doing the matching, us talking to the client. Right. Uh, it's not just a you know just a just a technology solution. In the future, it will be. In the future, we're going to provide tools for both the client and for the service provider that we hope uh, is going to keep them uh, on the Dudelio platform. Yeah, I guess but, that remains to be seen. You're only seven months old, so you don't know what happens at 18 months, right? I have no idea. I have no yeah. idea. Right, right. Um, so what are you finding? Are you seeing uh, serial entrepreneurs coming back and or, you know, an entrepreneur, acquisition entrepreneur, he's, he's got to have, you know, 100 conversations, 60, uh, you know, he's got to have that upside down funnel where it's, it's a, a lot of outreaches, 60 conversations, maybe 10 yeah. offers out there or five offers. Uh, are they doing due diligence on every one of those or are they just selecting one or two to say, I'm no. not in on that? Usually, uh, from what I've seen so far, that uh, we come in after an LOI has been signed, and once they're cl cl kind of closer to uh, closer to closing the transaction, so they know that this is the business that they want to acquire, and they're the seller has agreed that they're the right buyer, and that's when we come in. That's typically what we see. Um, a lot of times, we'll we'll get a request. From a client, um, this typically happens with a searcher, um, you know, search search fund. Uh, they'll come in, they'll submit a request, we'll connect them with the right due diligence provider, uh, and then the deal for some reason is going to fall through. They'll come back three months later, resubmit another request for another business, and we'll help <laughs> match uh, them with the right provider for that business, uh, and then uh, hopefully the deal will close and. Uh, they'll turn into uh, kind of a commercial engagement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So on the search funder, that's like kind of ideal client because most of these guys are funded by some kind of private equity fund like Abri Partners or something. And then they require due diligence to go to the next step, right? Yeah. I mean, I think everyone is re realistically, everyone's. Well, an independent sponsor is like, hey, man, I buy my own businesses for, you know, a million bucks. I'm, I'm going to go on my own. No, we, um, so we've probably searchers and independent sponsors are our biggest client base. Yeah. Uh, so we, we definitely see a lot of independent sponsors come to us uh, and uh, we help them find a due diligence solution. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, what kind of range in the business? I mean, you do, you see these numbers on the dashboard say, what kind of range of size of uh, the business are you seeing the most of? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say the majority of the businesses are between one and five million transaction value. Yeah. Probably, I'd say 80%, maybe 90% of what we see. But then there are the tail ends. So we've definitely seen businesses uh, that are smaller. So maybe 250, 500,000. And then uh, we've gotten requests for $90 million deals, uh, $50 million deals as well. Um, but you know, I, I really think that our sweet spot and where we add the most value is really in the one to $25 million uh, transaction range. And I, I apologize if there's uh, if you hear, if you're hearing drilling upstairs, <laughs> there's uh, they're doing some construction that they, it's good, good timing. So <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'm telling like a uh, number of episodes, and you let my dog barking in the background because somebody came to the door. Yeah, mm. uh, that yeah, that's cool. Uh, are, are these people that are you know one to five? It is really or one to twenty five is the transition of assets from the baby boomers to something else to to a new generation of buyers. That's the biggest probably slice of the pie, right? That's, that's the biggest. Uh, but we also have clients that are uh, SMBs, so small businesses, uh, buying other businesses. Uh, oh, really? It's not, yeah. it's not a big subset. I'd say, you know, probably, you know, 80% of our clients are the kind of what I'd call, you know, searcher. 
Yeah. Then there's, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe five, 10 percent of uh, independent sponsors. And then there's SMBs, uh, small family offices, um, kind of things like that. What are you trying to attack right now? Is that, I mean, small family offices would be a good source or reoccurring type. Is, is that a, a big private equity or, or do they, private equity already have their due diligence people set up and, or what? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think that our value is really, if, if, you're, if you're a small office, if you're three person private equity shop, three person family office, and you don't uh, you don't have the internal resources to help with due diligence. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to spend the time going out sourcing, uh, pricing, and hiring the right due diligence solution. I think that's really where we come in. Um, I don't think that we're the right solution for you know a fifty person investment shop. They probably already have someone. In uh, they probably have a CPA for yeah. a, a uh, forensic but, accountant. You know, yeah. At the same time, um, so I mentioned that we have 160 uh, due diligence service providers, but we also have partnerships and relationships with expert networks. So that gives us access to over 250,000 subject matter experts. Now, well, a lot. Well, of, yeah. Uh, good. Well, what do you mean by subject matter experts? What. Uh... So these are people that have deep subject matter expertise in a particular industry, sector, technology, uh, business type. So that's more of when you think of like a, a GLG, Zentro, Deep Bench, GuidePoint, uh, those types of solutions. Yeah. A lot of people don't uh, think of that uh, you know, as due diligence necessarily. But uh, we do have uh, some more on the private equity side. We do have some of those clients uh, that come to us uh, that ask uh, for help in sourcing uh, the right um, subject matter expert. And we help them with that. Uh, so we really take, you know, we're able to take kind of that load off of their plate and um, uh, help them source the right solutions. Yeah, I, I have to tell you that I'm in a couple masterminds, and one of the biggest challenges I see with acquiring, I'm not minimizing the acquirer's uh, capabilities. I mean, sometimes it's just not their superpower, but, you know, they'll put their financial numbers in there, and I go, well, look, man, uh, something happened in 2019 or 2020 with COVID, and uh, they're not able, their efficiency to turn cash into cash flow is just not there anymore. They can't do right. it. Uh, but that takes a financial analysis that right. uh, you know somebody needs to to dive into. The, you know, the efficiency dropped, and if you bought this business, it's going to cost you a lot more to acquire a customer and turn yeah. those assets into sales. Yeah, uh, or, or vice versa. Uh, there's a lot of businesses that uh, that gain <laughs> a lot of revenue, right, due to COVID. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it works, it works both ways and you really need someone with, uh, subject matter expertise to go in and see, you know, how sustainable is this run rate? How sustainable, uh, is this growth? Yeah. Right. Right. Now, but you don't see any of the data afterwards that the, uh, let's say the forensic accountant or the CPA or whoever it is, Hey, here's my analysis of the, uh, financials. You, you don't see that, right? Uh, so for an individual deal, no, I typically don't see that, yeah. but as part of the, uh, vetting process, uh, so everyone that wants to get, be, be part of the platform, we do have a vetting process. Uh, I do ask for, uh, samples of past work. Uh, I do ask to, if possible, talk to some past clients. A lot of times that's not possible. <laughs> so I'm not going to sit here and say that for every you know, person on the platform, we've talked to their previous clients. Um, but, uh, but yes, uh, I, I do ask for past work and I'm able to see um, how they present the results, what type of work they've done in the past. Yeah. Um, but for an individual deal, uh, no, I, I don't. I'm not part of that deliverable. Right. So 
if a guy, a guy, a girl, and whoever comes to the site says, hey, I need due diligence looking at a $500,000 Shopify store. Um, I sign up, I present all the data. How, how long would it take to get that analysis back? Uh, analysis or how long does it take to hire someone? Oh, to hire somebody, uh, you know, you get that you hire somebody and they start their work and then I get that analysis because money loves momentum. And yeah. yeah, you know, honestly, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, first, um, I guess, yeah, honestly, I guess, so we're, we're at the end of the year. Um, good luck right now trying to find someone to do a quality of earnings for you before uh, the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. I mean, we, we can do it, uh, but it's, it's tough. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that that factors into it. Second, uh, how quickly can you get the right information from the seller? I think that's actually the biggest factor here because a lot of times uh, m- maybe the seller doesn't, doesn't have the data handy. Maybe they don't, they don't even know how to get it. Oh my God. Uh, I, this knows? is, this is a subject that is so frustrating because, Hey, you got a great business and they, they give you the pie in the sky numbers and say, Hey, we're going to be doing this. And then you start asking for the financials. Can you send me an income statement? And they'll send you a screenshot or maybe partial financials. No, no cash flow statement, no balance sheet. I go, okay. Can, I need to get three years. I mean, you've right. been in business for five years. I, I need to see three. And it's, do you have an accountant or do you have anybody using Intuit or FreshBooks or anybody? Because that's five minutes to create. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times uh, people run multiple, I can tell you, I, I do this, right? So in addition to Dudelio, I have a couple of other projects. And the other projects I group under one uh, legal entity, one umbrella. Right. So right. if I ever wanted to sell that one other project, um, it, it would be pretty pretty hard for me to uh, separate the financials. So I'm you know I'm guilty of this as well, uh, and I think I think a lot of people do commingling your accounts yeah, right now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. What about international deals? I mean, I have just within the last three weeks, as you know, I do this podcast. And I've got a big presence on LinkedIn and Search Funder. And I have, at last five days, I've had somebody from a Slavic country, Latin America, and India offer businesses for sale, off-market deals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. what's your take on that? Does there Can I get somebody to do that in your group? Uh, so I'll tell you, we had, we had one request uh, come in for someone who was buying a cybersecurity company in Germany. Uh-huh. They needed a cybersecurity expert who also spoke fluent German. Um, I can tell you, uh, it, it, it took a very long time for me to find. I, I did find someone, but it, it took, I think it took a month. Yeah. And they, they, actually, they actually ended up hiring someone else. Okay. Uh, Dudelio. Uh, if you have these types of specific, someone, you know, a financial analyst who also speaks uh, Croatian, harder, harder to do. Okay. Well, you but, know what? I got to tell you something. Here, here's the uh, thing: if you buy any EU company at a certain level, they are required to uh, publish all of their financials, all of it, like any United, you know, uh, United Kingdom, uh, right. and most EU companies are required. I think it's two million dollars in revenue. Not sure, but it's. Uh, on a public domain site. Yeah, yeah. But, you, you know, I can tell you, we have, uh, in terms of uh, service providers, we have providers in the US, we have providers in the Philippines, we have providers in uh, China, we have providers in India, we have providers in uh, UK, um, France, um, Russia. I'm probably missing a couple of countries. So, there, there is a, a high probability that we'll be able to find someone. And, and even if we don't have someone in our network, at this point, uh, we have a pretty good understanding of how to source the right solutions. So even if you come to us with a request that we just, you know, we just don't have someone in our network that can fit, uh, fit the requirements, we'll go out and we'll source uh, a couple of options for you. Uh, yeah. So that's another thing that, um, you know, we're really good at. And I think just another 
kind of service that saves people time and you know, time is money. T time is money. So I, I'm going to go back to this. So because I like the speed on this thing. So if I, I go to your site, I fill out the forms, I find and I hire somebody and how long it takes to do that diligence. Let's say it's just the first level because it's only a $500,000 revenue company and maybe $100,000 in EBITDA. Yeah. Um, how long do you think I get that information back? And how do I grade that? I'm the, I'm the buyer. How do I myself grade that information say, that was valuable because it told me whether I should buy the business or what should multiple I should be offering for the business. Um, so again, you know, I, I think that if you're looking for a go, no go decision, I'm not sure yeah. that's, 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 that's the right way to think about it. Um, I think it's, if you've gained a better understanding of the business, if you have some things that you can go back to the seller and maybe negotiate uh, a better price or a better terms, I think that's valuable. Um, if you know, if you're doing, let's say, digital marketing due diligence, and you see uh, that there's some very easy levers that uh, you can pull after you acquire the business, yeah. I think that's valuable. Uh, if you're doing a background investigation on the company and all of a sudden you find that there's, well, you know, there's five lawsuits uh, in, uh, you know, different counties. Who does that? Is that in one of the three most bought packages? Like the, the lawsuit, uh, is, is that, that in a different package? Not, it's not the most requested thing. Um, yeah. And I, I don't, you know, I think for, for a $500,000 transaction, uh, do you want to do that background check? Um, something like that costs anywhere from five hundred to two thousand dollars. Yeah, does it make sense to spend? I don't know. If you're buying, um, you know, uh, twenty-five million dollar business or a ten million dollar business, may maybe maybe you'd want to do that. Yeah. yeah. The reason I ask that is I bought an e-commerce business and I go, look, I, I, I made that big mistake. And there was a lot of complaints because the uh, seller was not refunding in the time period that he stated on the website. And then they would go to this one site. I can't remember it. It's lost popularity. It was just complaints.com or something like that. And I, I didn't see that when I bought it. I just didn't. I missed it, which I should have done. Yeah. Yeah, you know the, the other um, the other aspect of this is you know there's also sell side due diligence. So let's say you're uh, you're one of these people that's retiring, right? You're trans you want to transition the business to someone else. Um, you might actually want to do some you know due diligence on the potential buyer. If you have five people who are interested in the business, uh, you want to make sure your employees are taken care of you might actually want to do a background check or background investigation on the buyer to make sure that, uh, you know, there's nothing there that kind of raises a red flag. They're so, uh, Nazis on uh, Facebook or they got a criminal record or, you know, whatever it may be. Right. Whatever it may be. Terrorist um, watch list. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know, uh, we've, we've been talking about this, you know, mainly from the buy side perspective and that's, that's 90, you know, that's, that's majority of what we see. But uh, there is the other side of this uh, that we also offer more, you know, sell side. To sell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What are you seeing as I, I, when we started the marketplace, uh, ours, which was Turbo Squid, uh, they, they, they started developing the KPIs and the drivers of the business. And it goes like, hey, man, these are the levers. What are the levers and KPIs for your business for Dudilio? That's a good question. Um, I mean, it is it. Uh, you know, ideally how we got to grow. And this is what uh, uh, the guy on LinkedIn said, says when buyers are starting to buy from sellers and sellers are starting for buyers, there was kind of organic growth in there. Yeah. Uh, I look at a couple of things. Um, you know, the, the simplest metrics, of course, uh, how many requests are being submitted, right? That's the top of the funnel. That's that's number one. Yeah. Number two, how many of those requests are uh, converting into an actual customer for uh, sellers on the platform, right? So that's conversion ratio. 
Uh, third, uh, what's the you know gross market value uh, of those contracts? What's the average value? So I think you know th those are kind of the things that I'm thinking about right now. Uh, yeah. Give me another, you know, ask me the same question in a year, and maybe I'll go back and say, no, I was a complete moron. <laughs> and actually, these are not the things that matter. It'll be, it'll be something else. Uh, yeah, yeah. We didn't know that. I mean, we started, you know, our uh, Turbo Squad right after eBay. So it was a second, like, we thought it was an eBay. We actually were going to buy the keyword 3D Bay. But, uh -huh. uh, you know, we got a little notice from an attorney. He said, no, no that, that's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what is the goal, long-term goal? I mean, do you have a revenue number or a uh, transaction number or a, you know, buy side, inventory side, a number on this? Or you you no, know, my goal is to be the one-stop destination for business buyers and private investors uh, to source due diligence providers. That's, yeah. that's my, that's kind of the overall goal. Um, so Right now, we just started inking partnerships with all the major marketplaces. Uh, so we are uh, the due diligence provider on uh, Perf Source, on BizNexus, on uh, Interexio, uh, and a couple of more that uh, I'll be announcing probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the goal right now to form these relationships to uh, be able to um, help you know as many as many business buyers as we can, and really learn about the market. How can we? Yeah. What are the services that we can offer? Right now, um, we are, you know, kind of purely a, a marketplace. Do, does the the matching, uh, but maybe uh, clients would prefer to see more of a productized solution. So maybe. Clients don't really care who does the work as long as they know what the output is and they know that it comes from you know, one of the you know, higher ranked uh, providers on the platform. So I, I don't know that yet. I think we're still learning about, uh, about the market and uh, figuring out you know, how we can add the most value. Yeah, let me ask you about that. So if uh, a buyer comes in, they get due diligence on their $500,000 company, and they like the work that the provider give, do they give scores and stuff? Because what happens is you saw this on Craig, not Craigslist, but uh, Jenny, uh, uh, you know, that service provider, you, you start getting scores and that person gets gravity and they get busier and busier and busier and they can raise their prices. And then, then the next guy comes up and goes, well, he's too busy. He can't get to me to right. me for three, four weeks, uh, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, just recently, we started uh, kind of formally uh, collecting reviews. We've always done it just over email, just kind of a post, um, you know, post project call. Uh, but recently, I've started uh, doing it in a more formal fashion with a form. Um, feedback, ratings, things like that. Yeah. Are you a developer or do you outsource that? You just have the design and say, hey, this is what we need to do. I mean, there's not, if you're not uh, for at a loss for examples on marketplaces on what works for most marketplaces, right? Yeah, no, I uh, I mean, I, I, I can build a form. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that, that part's pretty easy. But in terms of um, next step for the Dilio of building out the marketplace, it's definitely going to be outsourced. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm I, I can build a WordPress website. Um, that's that's about it. Uh, not not a big technical background. Yeah. Is there an industry that you're seeing more of? I, you know, there's more internet business. You know, there's micro acquire out there that just does SaaS businesses or independent Shopify type stuff. Uh, do you also do, let's say, offline manufacturing businesses? Yeah. So we we, we see it all. But, uh, you know, it's, it's actually interesting. It's a uh, vast majority of what we see are actually offline businesses. So oh, really? manufacturing, uh, restaurants, um, healthcare providers, um, all types of healthcare providers, uh, retail. What, what, kind of, what do you mean like healthcare providers? Like, uh, uh, like medical offices we've seen, we've gotten a couple of MSOs. Dental yeah. Office, yeah. Dental offices. Um, adult um uh what's it called uh, like home uh, home care oh home health care yeah 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 um so we've seen a couple of those um 
which is actually, you know, when I first launched Tudelio, I really thought that most of the requests uh, would come from a people buying uh, you know, online businesses, so tech enabled businesses. Yeah. Right? And number two, I thought most of the demand would really come um, like sub sub a million, sub two million transaction value. Yeah. And what I've seen is actually completely the opposite. Uh, most of the demand is from uh, you know one to five million, one to ten million transaction value. And it's mostly for uh, offline uh, businesses. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. I, so yeah, your I, thesis, your original thesis, uh, why do you think that is? Do you think these internet guys are more savvy and said, hey, I don't need to do the digits? Or do they already have you know, somebody that does it for them? I think it's a couple of things. Uh, number one, I think, yes. I think uh, if you're buying a Shopify store for any sizable amount, you probably already have experience in e-commerce. Yeah, so that's, that's number one. Number two is I think it's I think it's just a function of uh, the communities that I'm active in. So I'm active in Search Funder. I'm active in a couple of these other uh, entrepreneurship through acquisition type of communities, and uh, and those folks generally go after uh, offline businesses, plumbing landscaping, healthcare, manufacturing. So yeah, that is true. That is yeah. true. I mean, I, I'm in a veteran community and they all they're doing is buying offline businesses. Right. So I think, um, you know, I think that's actually the biggest reason is just uh, most of the clients we've seen are searchers um, and these are the type of businesses they're buying. So that's where we see demand. Now, with the partnerships that we've uh, we're starting to ink with the online business marketplaces, yeah. uh, I'm, uh, my theory is I think we're going to start to see more um, more of these uh, due diligence requests for uh, online businesses like SaaS uh, and um, you know e-commerce. Uh, but uh, that place your bets. You don't know yet. Yeah, place your bets. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's cool. I mean, where do you think this is could go? I mean, I, do you have a five-year work backwards? I mean, I just read this great book called uh, Start at the End by uh, Dave Lebinsky. Is like you, you start at the end, you design your goals, and you move backwards. Uh, and then, you know, make it small, little accomplishments. And I saw this great interview with a couple podcasters called My First Million, and they were interviewing yep. Rob Durbeck, Durdeck, the, the – uh, 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 the skateboard guy and the ridiculousness and man, that guy, I would have never thought he was as sharp, wicked smart as he is. Yeah. Well, anybody that built a hundred million dollar fortune skateboarding. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, this may be a little bit off topic, but, um, uh, I think any celebrity who is out there, who you see, you know, the Kardashians, for example, or Paris Hilton, I think a lot of people think they're um, maybe not the sharpest tool in the shed. I, I think completely opposite. I, I yeah. think it takes a lot of smarts to uh, to kind of sustain that celebrity to build those businesses. And I think with Rob, it's the same thing, right? He started off as just a skateboarder, and uh, you know, on the surface, you think, okay, he's just you know, a guy uh, riding the half pipe. Uh, but I, th I think it's it's incredibly smart. You have to be incredibly smart too. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty funny interview. And I know this is out yeah. top, but he goes, but yeah, when he right. does these tricks <laughs> and he gets to the day before the tricks are right, because he said, This is the stupidest thing I'm ever gonna do. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, these partnerships, where where do you need what do you think you need to grow? I Let's mean, say you want to be a $5 million business in transaction. You're taking the toll back and forth. You got great organic growth. What do you think you need to get there? I need, I think, uh, brand awareness. I think a lot of people just don't know about Didilio, uh, don't Yeah. Something like this exists. Um, so I think that that's, that's probably number one uh, because I think there's a lot of great uh, – great tailwinds there to make the Delio successful. Uh, you see, you know, it's kind of, we discussed earlier, 
um, transaction volumes are at all time highs, more people are retiring, there's more, uh, more deals, more deal flow, more transactions. So I think these are all things that are very conducive to a marketplace like Dudilio. So I think it's just uh, getting the word out um, and, you know, obviously bringing in, <laughs> bringing in clients and yeah. building these partnerships where, uh, you know, my hope is that when someone's searching for a business on a marketplace, uh, will be right there uh, where they can click a button uh, and get, uh, you know, get kind of solve their due diligence needs for, uh, for the business. Um, that's, at least that's that's my feast. That's that's what I'm hoping uh, will drive a lot of the demand. Yeah, well, I got to ask. I I didn't ask this. What when do they pay for it? Do they pay for it when they just start the process, or do they pay for it when they find the person that they want to hire? Yeah. So uh, so we're completely free. So the Dilio is free to use uh, right now. Uh, right now. I, yeah, well, okay. You know, so this is what the business yeah. model is going to be. Uh, you know, in ten years. But right now, we're completely free to use for clients. We get paid by the service provider. The service provider, because you basically found them a lead, which exactly. they would have had to spend to get anyway. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I'd say, you know, I'll add that we get paid only when the service provider gets paid. So it's yeah. not a it's not a pay to play type of model that some marketplaces have, where they charge you, you know, five hundred bucks a month to be on the platform plus you know, 3% of whatever you make. Uh, no, we are purely, if the service provider makes money, we make money, all incentives are aligned. Oh, and, that, I, I, I love that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a yeah. free matchmaking service for yeah. now, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so I think, uh, I, I think it's a very attractive value proposition. I think it's really just uh, spreading the word that this exists um, and uh, gaining some you know, recognition in the marketplace. Yeah. Do you help um, buyers go, like know, help them get smarter faster by saying, hey, this is what you're going to ask your service provider? Yeah. So I think. Or is that just a great idea you should offer at the point? So, yeah. No, that's, that's part of it. So, you know, we, we do have a lot of uh, free content and templates on our blog that kind yeah. of talk about some of this. Um, but, you know, I think the biggest service that we can provide is to educate the business buyer on what type of due diligence uh, is available to them and what makes sense, what maybe doesn't make sense, how much they can expect to spend on something. So I think that's, that, that's another uh, kind of piece of the puzzle there. It's just educating the business buyer um, whether they're buying a manufacturing business, a restaurant, uh, landscaping, an e-commerce store, what should they be looking for? Yeah. What so has the, has the why question already been answered when they come to you? Yeah, I, I think so. I think yeah. that, um, yeah, I, th I think it's, it's hard to say that someone buying a business doesn't know that they need due diligence or that they need an attorney to, you know, and I'll, I'll also say that, you know, I use due diligence in a very kind of wide, uh, wide scope, um, you know, hiring an attorney to draft an asset purchase agreements, probably most people don't consider that part of due diligence, but, uh, you know, but, but I do in, in our platform, so we can help people with that. Um, you know, just trying yeah. to think what, what else is maybe, you know, kind of being connected to a subject matter expert um, that's another area that maybe a lot of people don't consider part of the diligence, but we do. Um, and then also we have, um, as part of our platform, uh, not just, uh, service providers who, um, who do the due diligence, but we also have what I would call deal Sherpas. Yeah. Uh, these are folks that can help you, um, finance a deal can help you analyze. Hey, can you uh, hold on yeah. one second? This is a great conversation, but first I need to pause one second. Yeah. yeah hold on. So Roman, tell me, uh, I'm really interested in this Sherpa. Tell, tell me more about this service part. Yeah. So uh, we have part of the platform, part of the network uh, past searchers. 
uh, that uh, have kind of gone through the process and now uh, do consulting uh, for uh, other uh, other uh, acquirers that help uh, help them kind of navigate uh, this world, help them uh, find the deals, how to talk to brokers, how to do you know outreach to a potential target, how to structure a deal, how to negotiate a deal. So things that again you know probably don't fall in the you know due diligence sphere, uh, but uh, are very helpful for someone who's maybe doing this the first time or uh, looking for help, um, just, uh, just general. I love this. I mean, because I am part of a mastermind of the Epic Group, which is a acquiring businesses and Roland Fraser and Adam Lyons and Pat Baker and Marty Funky and Mark McRae, some guys I interviewed, and they are masterful on the phone. I mean, and it's like, I got a guy on the phone that's done a hundred deals. He is masterful when talking about it, you know, negotiate. He's not negotiating. He's developing a rapport and finding out what the seller needs. And then he'll customize his conversation about what the customer needs. And it's, you know, most people will first get in, and go, hey, well, send me your uh, three years of financials. Well, then they start pitching on each other's counts and the deal's over. These right. having a Sherpa like that with experience is awesome idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we, you know, we have a, uh, I don't know the exact count, but we definitely have. Uh, How many do you have in there? Yeah. Oh, uh, more than a dozen, I'm sure. More than a dozen? Yeah. Than Hopefully this call, people hearing this, they'll, they'll, they'll sign up and more. Yeah. Oh, hopefully, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it's still, it's a free service to be introduced, but when they sign up, yeah. it's a part of the deal. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's free service. You know, we're happy to answer any questions, of course. Uh, we provide proposals from the service providers so they can see uh, what's the potential deliverable, uh, learn about each provider, what's the estimated fee range, uh, and then uh, we answer any questions again, and then we make an introduction to one or two or three providers that, uh, that, that the client thinks uh, may work for them. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you know, a lot of this is also you do need to ultimately get on the phone with a due diligence service provider and make sure you have a good rapport. Uh, it's not just uh, finding someone that can do the work. I think you also need to have a good, uh, good working relationship and kind of a good conversation. Yeah, be like somebody you're doing business with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Roman, yeah. Uh, I have taken you over the hour, Mark, and I really appreciate the time because you talked about some subjects uh, that uh, I, I just didn't know that were you were offering. So, look, hey, we've got Roman Balin. He's the founder of Due Dilio and M&A Due Diligence uh, Marketplace. He can be found at Due Dilio, D-U-E-D-I-L-I-O.com. So, Roman, thank you so much for your time. If uh, you know, if you you're also available on LinkedIn and SearchFinder, but uh, go to dodilio.com. Thank you. Great, uh, great to be here. Appreciate it. All right.